It's Meryl Goldsmith, and it's not a lineup in front of a brick, <laughs> a brick wall. It's actually a new driving through history, and a couple of familiar faces here, and we're going to see some classic cars belonging to Matt and Julianne Sherrill from Gould Insurance. So driving through history, one thing that drives you two together as a father and daughter, your love of cars. Yes. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I grew up with my dad and collecting vehicles, fixing vehicles, car shows, everything. And it's, I was born and raised in it. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and have you been like this? I mean, even when you were like a little kid, has this been a <laughs> lifelong Life thing, Matt? Lifelong. I, I used to uh, spend a lot of time in my bedroom as a kid putting together the plastic models. And I try to buy the models that had the three in one. They had three different versions you could make. So there was a bunch of extra parts. So I'd always save the extra parts and then try to soup up the cars and put different tires on them and put big engines in them. But yeah, since I can ever remember, my grandmother, Ruth Peterson, wonderful lady, um, she used to send home a model every Friday night with my dad because my dad worked at the insurance agency with her and she'd go to Goodwin's and buy a model and send it home with him. And by Sunday, I had that thing all painted and ready to go. <laughs> that, is, that is terrific. Now, did you ever do stuff like that when you were little? I wasn't into models. My brother was definitely into the models more. Um, I was more just along for the ride. I loved going to the car shows. I loved growing up around this. Yeah. yeah. So have you driven some of your dad's classic cars? Do you, yes. do you have permission? I do. <laughs> I actually took his Bel Air to prom uh, my senior year. So I drove that to prom one year. Wow. And uh, I've driven the Corvette a handful of times, but it's, it's, it makes me nervous. <laughs> it's such a nice car that yes, I do drive them. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. And you you know, are you chill about it, Matt? Or I, I am. I think yeah. I, last time she took the Corvette, I think I took to a. I, I said to her when she was leaving, "Don't crack it up." And and she turned around and within I don't know, it was literally three minutes. She was back in the driveway, and I said, "I thought you were going for a ride." And she goes. I don't know, you told me not to smack it up, and I, that just... <laughs> Too much pressure. Me out, so I, right back in the driveway. Well, I mean, you do have a couple of really cool vehicles of your own do. that you don't need any permission or feel bad about it. Nope. But I have a feeling, Matt, that if something did happen, I mean, she would know how to deal with it. I mean... <laughs> I, I would absolutely make her fix it. <laughs> and it would probably look better than it does now. So I have all the faith in the world. I think she knew what a half-inch wrench was before she knew what a, you know... A, a set of or a doll look like. She knew what a half inch wrench was. I think this is just terrific. And you know, your involvement with cars for both of your lives, your love of car shows, the Amesbury car show. I mean, yeah. and also, Matt, before we go look at the vehicles, you know, your involvement with the Amesbury Carriage Museum, you have been a huge, you, you and your family, big supporters for a very long period of time. Yeah, I just remember when I, I actually kind of first got involved with the city of Amesbury when I came to work with my dad. And uh, I remember Holly Patton and Margaret Rice and all the the old names that th their vision and Harriet Gould, they wanted a carriage museum. And when the opportunity arose for me to get involved, I, I jumped right in both feet and you know, it kind of morphed out of a out of just a carriage museum now to a, a, an industrial history center, and that that I think is what took it over the finish line because it wasn't solely focused on just carriages because there is a an amazing amount of industry that happened in Amesbury. So to tell that story and bring more people in. I'm, I'm behind that 100%. And financially helping us out as well. Yep. So thank yep. you, thank you very, very much. So let's look at some cars, All right. shall we? Yes. All right, we've got four vehicles to show you as we are driving through history with Matt and Julianne Sherrill. So can you share a little bit about this truck and its history? And earlier she had it on, man. <laughs> Like two miles away, you could hear this thing coming, you know. <laughs> so talk yeah. about the vehicle. So I bought the truck, I believe it was 2015. It was a Southern truck, uh, two wheel drive, blue and white. Uh, we had plans to build it forever, my boyfriend and I, and he needs a deadline. He needs a deadline <laughs> to get things done. 
so I told him I want Carriage Town Car Show 2017. I want this truck on the bullnose. I want it there. And uh, let's see, May rolled around in 2017 and it was still a two-wheel drive truck. And I said, God, about a month. What are we doing? And he completely frame off restoration. In 28 days, it went from a blue two-wheel drive truck to this. Really? Yes. That's amazing. I mean, so the tires are huge. Yes. The whole thing is huge. <laughs> yes. yeah. What was the motivation behind your choices when, you know, because it's not like a restoration because yeah. it's a, a it's a creation of something new out of many different things. And I know yes. nothing about this. So that's that's the layperson, right? You know, so so what was your inspiration? He told me that I could build my dream truck. So I started looking at different things like it has a uh, front clip out of an 89 Suburban so it's different headlights than an 84. Um, I said I, I want it tall I want to I want it big so it's an 8 inch lift on 37s. Um, the hardest thing was picking the color. I said I wanted gray and I couldn't find a gray that I wanted and he said well it's in the paint booth you need to pick a color <laughs> so we went down to Amesbury Chevy we drove through the parking lot and I saw a 2017 Camaro in switch, switchblade metallic switchblade metallic and I said, okay that's it that's, that's it. my color <laughs> and he's like all right let's paint it so this is what we got so what is it like inside is it a standard is it an automatic um how does it feel to drive it is it um is it four passengers i think it is or maybe it's a squishy four yes, right yes. yes yes so it is uh an automatic with a ls157 out of an 01 camaro so it's a newer motor um it's a bench seat so it fits us on the dog and uh all new seat cover new dash new carpet new everything pretty much or aftermarket I should say um, but yeah it's I got to build my dream truck so how does it little, feel when you're driving it around it's awesome because everyone's looking well they they see the yeah. truck and <laughs> they then hear they the truck it, and they, <laughs> they hear it they see it and then they see a girl driving it and they there's a lot of double takes out there yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful what was the reaction when you had it at the car show I couldn't stop smiling yeah I couldn't stop smiling <laughs> It's really spectacular, and um, but this isn't the only vehicle that you are, yeah. you know, that you are responsible for, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is a 1984. I'm calling it kind of a Chevy, but it, you know, you're talking about all these different, you know, yes. brands of cars kind of mixed into this. So, so yes. what do you officially, when you register it, what is it called? It is a 1984 Chevy Silverado. Kinda. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Let's go look at the next vehicle, shall we? Well, we've moved ahead 12 years, right, Julianne? Yes. 1996? Yes. What is this vehicle? It is a 1996 GMC Sierra. Is it a kind of like the other one? How much <laughs> how much of the Sierra is in, is in this yes. vehicle? It's beautiful. The red is yes. stunning. Yeah. Uh, so my dad bought this brand new in 1996. Uh, I bought it in 2010 off of him and it's pretty much stock besides the wheels tires i put tow mirrors on it and a roll pan Other okay that, it's it's stock so this isn't like the other vehicle that's like we got a little bit of this and we got a little no. bit of that no. no but this is this is also a beauty thank you so tell me about this and um I would imagine that your dad took really good care of it. So how much restoration, or was it just because it was older and it needed work? So he never really drove this in the winter. So luckily I haven't really had to deal with any rust repair or anything like that. I have had a couple panels replaced, uh, but other than that, it's, it's low mileage for the year. It was well taken care of. So I definitely inherited and purchased a a new vehicle <laughs> between the two do you drive one more than the other or do you have like a, a vehicle that you use for like going to the grocery store and stuff like that so i do have a toyota tacoma uh i wouldn't say it's small it's it's lifted with big tires as well <laughs> somehow there's a theme here <laughs> yes <laughs> somehow yes. and uh these these two trucks here are definitely summer vehicles they are stored during the winter they don't see road salt uh they're tucked away for the winter months. Uh, I would say I probably drive the silver truck more than I drive this truck just because 
I want this to remain as low mileage, as clean, as beautiful as I can. Well, I think it also has a little bit of a, a more special connection where the other one yes. you just, you know, purchased off somebody who's like selling a car. Yeah. But, you know, your dad bought this. Did he buy this new? Brand new. Brand new. Yeah. So he buys this new, he has it, and then you buy it off of him. Yeah. Like, I can't even do the math in my head, but many years later. Yes. And, um, it is it is just beautiful. I mean you, you must you must get a lot of looks and, and red just yes. like woo, it's red. Yes. It's, it's it's really terrific. Yes, definitely. It's uh, you don't see many this body style still together in one piece <laughs> driving down the road. <laughs> so it's very nice to still have this and be able to drive it around. We're gonna now turn things over to Matt who's got a couple of classic cars that he's gonna be sharing. Thank you so much, Julianne. I've just enjoyed getting to know you and getting to know your vehicles. Thank you very much. I'm more than thrilled to show them off. And I think we need to maybe turn one of them on later. Absolutely. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't think there's really anything like that. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do that. Thank you. Let's move on to a classic car and uh, we'll chat with Matt Sherrill. It's Meryl Goldsmith again, and we are driving through history with Matt Cheryl, we went from Julianne's trucks to this beautiful classic Corvette. Can you tell me a little bit about it, Matt? Sure. Um, actually, uh, my very first car that I bought was in 1976, and it was a 55 Chevy. My parents thought I was crazy because here I am buying this vehicle that's, that's really old at the time, and they had no faith in my ability to be able to work on it. But I tinkered, I changed the engine and transmission, I got the thing going and then ended up going to college and I put the car away for a few years, but I have, I have loved cars my entire life. I've owned so many different cars. I've owned Fords, I've owned Chevys, uh, but Chevy is my, that's, that's where my heart is with, with Chevrolet. My mom and dad always had Chevys. My mother always had convertibles. So we had a 64 convertible, we had a 68 convertible, a 72 convertible. So um, Chevrolet runs through my blood. And I've always loved Corvettes, but you know, you're talking the pinnacle of Chevrolet, the most expensive car that they produce. So the chances of me owning a Corvette were relatively slim. <laughs> um, but I went to work with my dad over at Peterson Insurance Agency. I had a I think it was a 1966 Chevelle 396, big block, beautiful car, butternut yellow, one of those colors where you either hate it or you love it. And uh, I saw, I, I was like, you know, I really want a Corvette. And at that point, it was it was 1987, and my son was was born in February of 1987. And Good bought, time to buy a Corvette, right? I this car <laughs> in January of 1987. Oh, and your wife was okay with it? My wife was okay with it, but my father was not. My father Funny. was not very happy with me. I worked with him. And he called me foolish, whatever. But that was back in 1987, and I still have it. So it's... Uh, part of the family, you know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Of course. Uh, again, this red color. I mean, there is something about a sports car being red that, uh, you know, it does just grab you, doesn't it? I mean, Prince, little red Corvette, Yes, right? I know. <laughs> Gotta Absolutely. have a red Corvette. So you bought this car and what have you done to it? I tried as hard as I could to leave this car alone. In the car world, uh, people hear of matching numbers. Oh, I have a matching numbers car. Well, basically what that means is an entire drivetrain, engine, transmission, rear end, everything about the car came out of the factory with that drivetrain. So and you can actually go by and you can go and document this. I'm assuming yeah. that yeah. Matt, that's what the matching number means, yeah. right? There's a stamp on the engine block that has the VIN number. The, the last six numbers of the VIN are stamped on the engine block. So you look on the engine block and we match the VIN. There's a trim tag on the on the uh, transmission that has the VIN number, and there's a trim tag on the rear end that has the VIN number. So this is a completely matching numbers car. So I didn't want to mess with it. I really wanted to keep it as original for as long as I could. 
uh, three years ago, I had to make the painful choice of doing something with it because the engine was very tired. It was smoking so bad oh my that I went to a car show in Kensington and the police thought when I left, I had smoked the tires because there was so much smoke behind the car and the oil was bleeding down through the cylinders. And I just said, look, I, I've got to do something. So Because you still want to use it, yes, right? I yeah. mean, because it's in your heart. But I mean, I would imagine having a car like this. I mean, yeah, you're not going to be driving it in the winter, but... I on a day like today, you want to be taking this for a yeah. little little ride. Right? Yeah, you know, there's a saying in the car industry: it's only original once, and that means it's it's still as it was when it came out of the factory. It's not been taken apart. So I wrestled with that. What I did was I, I if people have heard of Mika Auctions, so I called Mika Auctions and I talked with their consigner and said. Hey, I'm talking about taking the engine, the transmission, everything out of this car, refurbishing it, rebuilding it, and putting it all back in. Is that going to hurt the value of the vehicle? And their their answer was basically no. As long as you leave it as original as you can, it'll still be okay. So I mean, do people I understand that eventually something would stop running yeah. because it's mechanical, yeah. right? Yes. yes. And and with a vehicle that sits for six or seven months of the year. The rings actually kind of fuse to the cylinder walls, and when you go to start it in the spring, if they're not free, they can catch on the cylinder wall and break the ring, and then that's what lets the oil down through. So it was just it was suffering from old age and 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 trying to be as careful as I can by not driving it in winter time and whatnot. So I rebuilt the entire engine. When I got the entire engine out, I rebuilt the entire suspension, all brand new shocks. Uh, tie rod ends, ball joints, A-arm bushings. I replaced the bushing in the rear. I replaced the uh, the spring bushings. I replaced the trailing arm bushings, shocks all the way around. This thing rides unbelievable compared to what it was before. It used to wander and smoke and it, it drives beautifully now. I'm very, very happy with it. And, you know, intend on uh, passing it down when the time comes. Wow, that's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is just, it is just gorgeous. I mean, it is like the quintessential Corvette. You know, when you when you think about it, I think it would this vehicle right here. These are without a doubt. They're called mid-year Corvettes because uh, the body style changed in 1963. You you might have heard, even the layperson has heard of a split window Corvette. I don't know if you have, but the split window Corvette came out in 1963. This body style, this body style lasted till 1967. These are the mid-year Corvettes. These bring all the money. There was a, this is a 66, a 1967 Corvette just not too long ago. Uh, it was a, an L88 big block 67 convertible Corvette sold for $2.3 million. Wow. Yeah. The, wow. the, these things have won. Wow. The rarer wow. it is, the rarer the options, the more the money. But crazy, crazy money when you have big blocks. And when I was looking for this car, I actually bought it down in Saugus, Mass. I knew what I wanted. I knew what I was looking for. But I went to a place up in, uh, it was up in New Hampshire. It was near Manchester. And it was a, all they sold was Corvettes. And I had my eye on a beautiful 1966 396 big block couldn't pull it off it was four or five thousand dollars more than this i paid twenty one thousand dollars for this back in 1987. what do you think the value of this is today or you don't want or you don't no, want to say no it's it, it's it's the value is what people want to pay for it right but with the originality this is a sixty thousand dollar car um yeah it's it's the lower end because it's got the small block so it's not it's not a higher end, big option car, but still very, very collectible. Before we move on to your next vehicle, how fast does this go? Well. <laughs> and have you ever tested it out? With all or my, are you willing to admit that? <laughs> for all my friends at the Amesbury PD, uh, I actually had this car doing about 125. It was after I rebuilt it, rebuilt the suspension, and felt like I had, I had brand new tires, 
So I felt like if I was ever going to test it out, that was the time. And there was more to go. I was just like, you know what? That's enough. I don't need to be stupid and crash this thing. So I shut it down. But yeah, 125 is the fastest I've been. Wow. Yep. So we're going to move on to the fourth and final vehicle in this Driving Through History show. So Matt, this car is actually a few years older than the Corvette. Can you tell me about this vehicle? Sure. This is a 1964 Chevy Bel Air. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I have my parents to blame for my affinity for Chevrolet. My, my mother actually owned a 1964 Chevy Impala. There's the three models. There's the Pristine, the Bel Air, and the Impala. The Impala is the luxury version of this car. It's a medium grade car. Uh, I actually bought this car from Wallace Chevrolet in 1989 over in Hampton, New Hampshire. Uh, the original owners had traded it in for a Chevy Citation. So it was sitting in the So bank. this had one family before one family. before you bought it. Yep. Wow. One family. So That's got to be so rare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And, and so it was kind of sitting in the back of the lot when I went by and I saw it. So I went in and, and talked to the guys and they said, oh, yeah, we just got this in on a trade. And uh, I, I asked a few questions about it. And, you know, uh, I swear it was uh, two hours later, I was... You were driving at home? <laughs> driving at home. Another foolish move, by the way. Uh, but I only paid $1,500 for this car back in 1989. So um, what kind of shape was it in? Or is this the shape that it was in? No. It was uh, definitely owned by the, the typical little old lady family, uh, but it had been in Seabrook all its life. So there was rust and there was, you know, issues with the paint and whatnot. The interior was kind of ripped up here and there. Uh, so I drove it for a couple of years and then decided, you know what, I'm going to restore this car. So I did what is uh, called a frame-off restoration where I literally removed the entire body off the thing. And really? I start from scratch. Uh, this car had a six cylinder, three on the tree. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's the, the, the hand shifter for us <laughs> non car <laughs> people, right? You're talking about the, on you used to be able to shift on the right column. on the, on right the on column. the column. Yeah. Yep. It was yeah. First, second, you know, yep. third, reverse. Yep. So, uh, it had a three speed six cylinder. And when I was restoring it, I was like, you know, I want to have a little bit of fun with this car. So I put in a 1968 Corvette motor with a four-speed and newly gloss. And it's just, it's amazing because I rebuilt the engine in this back in probably 1991. And I have not touched it since. And this car runs fantastic. So it's like your second Corvette kind of Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's I mean, actually... It I like this car more than I like the Corvette because I don't care about this car. I don't care if it's left in the Walmart parking lot. I'll drive it anywhere. I'll leave it. it it's it's great transportation, and it's a blast to drive. It really is. The color is really terrific, and I do hope that that shows because it's it looks like blackish, but it's really not. It's a super, super deep blue. It's, it's yes. special. It's, it's, it's actually the original color that the car came in. It's called Daytona Blue. It's a 1964 color. Really? Uh, I want to call Julianne back into the shot here. Um, we're going to wrap up this driving through history, but I do understand that there's a little bit of an interesting story involving your um, Chevy truck. Do you, want to, do you want to share yes. that a little bit? Yes. So when we were building my silver truck, uh, at the time, I had no interest in getting married. So my boyfriend said, well, I'll build you your dream truck, and that will be your engagement thing. So we call it The Rock. <laughs> you know, sticking with the diamond ring in the back window. Oh, my goodness. So Matt, before I let you go, uh, let's talk about the car show in Amesbury, because I know that... Maybe I know a lot of people are wondering about that. Yeah, we, you know, obviously we want to have the car show. The the car community is just itching to be able to get back out again and show their cars. And of course, with the pandemic going on last year and into this year, uh, the the car people have just not been able to gather. So, uh, what we're hoping for is we're hoping that when the state uh, lifts the restrictions and the city of Amesbury lifts the outdoor restrictions, then yeah, we, we definitely want it. We talked about it. 
we figured it, it will take us about a month to pull it together. So if we can't do it in June, we we want to do it in uh, September. Uh, Wes Pattengill, great guy. He he's uh, you know puts it on. He he chairs the whole event for us, and he has plans to do the new report show. So if they pull off the new report show, I'm pretty confident we can do the Amesbury show. Wonderful. So the best place to get information? Would be to look on our Facebook page, uh, Amesbury Carriage Town Car Show. Sorry, Carriage Town Car Show Facebook. So uh, that's where we'll give any updates and things like that. But uh, we have a website as well. So check it out. We'll be uh, you know updating it. We'll be doing sponsors and things like that. So. Uh, check us out on Facebook. So fingers crossed, maybe June, maybe more likely September after the Newburyport car show. Yeah, yeah, Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So Matt said, do you want to go for a drive? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Which car? The Corvette. Of course. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs>